Good afternoon, everyone. Let's begin. Um, so I've just collected homework 12, which is the air quality and treatment assignment. And um, just as a reminder, we're scheduled to have a quiz next time when we meet on Tuesday. And that quiz will be covering basically the content since the last, uh, let's see, what did we have more recently, a quiz or an exam? The exam. So it'll be the material since the last exam until and including uh, the assignment that you turned in. It won't, the quiz won't include today's lo uh, lecture topic. The next assignment, homework 13, because it's a short one, has a relatively quick turnaround. That'll be due on Thursday. Um, I've handed out the assignment sheet for that. You can see it's just four problems from the book. Each of them is relatively uh, straightforward. The first two problems you'll be able to solve after today's lecture, and then the last two problems you'll be able to solve after the things we go over on Tuesday. All right, I've uploaded my comments for your draft versions of part two to iLearn. For those of you who submitted through iLearn and on time, there were a handful of submissions that <clears throat> were sent to me by email, and I haven't looked over those yet. So uh, in general, uh, most people are headed on the right track. Um, I think probably the most common advice I gave was, you know, do more research and get more references. I said that the minimum was four, right? Uh, so I think min if you achieve the minimum, then maybe you're on track to get a grade of C or B if it's really well written. But if you want to get an above average grade, then you need to do more than the minimum number of research references. And it's not just a matter of counting beans. It's also you know, the, the quality of what you're able to synthesize and write about is, um, is improved if you have a greater depth of research. Um, so that's the, the number one comment I gave was a little bit more research would help your paper. The second most common uh, feedback I gave to students was that this paper isn't just about summarizing the articles you read. It's synthesis. So it's taking what you've read, draw it all together, and um, formulate your own conclusion about where is the research in that field headed uh, for your topic. Um, I'm going to post a link on iLearn later this afternoon that talks more about a synthesis type paper like this. If you're still having a hard time understanding how to make the jump between reading references and then combining it all together with your own ideas, this link that I'm going to provide gives you some suggestions on how to make that leap. Some students are doing a great job. Others need to uh, give it a little bit more attention. So that's the project. As a reminder, the final draft of your assignment isn't due until the end of the semester. And I think our last lecture is on January 7th, right? So that's when the overall project is due. And if you'd like to stop by and uh, come to my office to talk about the comments I gave you on the paper, I'd be more than happy to have you stop by, so we can definitely discuss it. So any questions about that? All right. Well, before we get started with the noise pollution stuff, I thought we would uh, take a second look at our trip to the wastewater treatment plant. It's a good chance for us to, uh, to talk about what you saw and answer any questions. We were all sort of in a rush to start our vacation, and it's kind of a noisy environment anyway. So. It didn't lend itself to very good uh, discussion. But let's uh, do this review. Just look at the video that I made of the treatment plant and then spend a few minutes talking about that. <clears throat> so now that I've clicked that link, it should take probably seven or eight minutes for the uh, browser to come up. And then we'll be able to watch our video. Thought I was exaggerating, right? Seven or eight minutes? Hopefully it won't take that long, but we'll see. There we go. I think the sound isn't working, but they're really uh, there's no narration. I did subtitles instead. All right. By the way, I think I'm going to stop the recording for this part. All right. Well, 
You can uh, show that video to your friends and family to amaze them with the sights that you've seen and uh, assure them you're getting your money's worth with your education. Okay, we're talking about noise with our next chapter. And at the simplest definition, noise is just an unwanted sound. And so what's the difference between music and noise? Sometimes it's a matter of perspective. If you like what you're hearing, then it's music. But if, uh, if you don't like what you're hearing, then it becomes noise, right? So I feel that, like, for example, there's country music. Maybe you've heard of country music. I think that's noise, because I think it's the worst stuff ever, country music. But um, so there's a interesting clip here that's showing a jackhammer. <laughs> interesting is what makes it so noisy is that this equipment is inducing vibrations. And in, in the success of slides, what we're going to look at is that the source of all sound, whether it's stuff we like or stuff we don't like, it's all because of vibrations. The sound of my voice right now, what you're hearing, is the, vibra the vibrations of my vocal cords. That's, that's why I'm able to speak. There are birds that have more find control over their vocal cords and they can imitate any kind of sound in nature, whether it's the cell phone or a chainsaw. There are birds that uh, have the ability to, it's almost like listening to a recording of the things that they imitate because their vocal cords can uh, imitate those sounds. All right, um, we were going to also watch a video that was talking about the health effects of sound, but um, that would be really pointless without these speakers working, so we're not going to watch that video. It was just basically saying they've recently do done a study, and um, with that study they have learned, hold up, all right, uh, they did a study and found that the, uh, for example, people's blood pressure is raised by living in the, uh, the vicinity of an airport. And specifically, this, this was done in London's airport. That's what we're seeing this picture of, is that's not a photoshopped picture of an airplane landing on houses. They, these are people who live in the vicinity of uh, London Heathrow Airport. And so um, people's blood pressure can raise. There's a measurable um, increase in their stress levels. And uh, there are hormones that the body uh, gives off like a cortisone that um, over the long term, if you have too much of that stress hormone, can cause damage to your immune system. And so living in a noisy environment definitely has an effect. So we said the simplest definition of noise is just an unwanted sound. Uh, if we take it a little bit further, what we say is that uh, it doesn't matter how loud it is, uh, noise or even noise pollution can be something that induces an undesirable effect, whether it's physiological, meaning uh, with the body, or psychological, meaning with the mind. And so uh, it could be just a quiet tapping. And I used to live, many years ago when I lived on campus, I lived uh, on the ground floor and there was a villa above me. And it was a kid who liked to play with marbles. And he would drop marbles onto the concrete when I'm trying to sleep, and he woke up very early. This child was an early riser, like 4.30, 5 o'clock, the kid is waking up and playing with his marbles first thing in the morning. And so it's maybe not so loud, but it's a matter of context because I'm trying to sleep, and so the irritation level is high. And then uh, it was also maybe just the, uh, 
I never knew when the next marble was going to come. It was a psychological warfare almost, right? Yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk about, today we're going to do some calculations about how you can um, combine noise sources together and, um, and maybe if you're accustomed to the white noise, you won't hear it when the marble drops. So it, it would still be noisier, but it's sometimes the difference that we hear. Like when someone pauses during a speech and then they start talking again, that maybe gives you some impact, you know, because it's the contrast. And so if there's white noise generator going, then the other noise, it's not like it made the other noise quieter. It's just you don't no notice the noisy thing. So think about in your life, what noise irritates you? Because everyone has certain noise or a time that it really bothered you. Um, <laughs> another time I think of is I almost lost my mind. Maybe I'm really sensitive to noise. It could be. But we were going to a wastewater treatment plant, me and the students, and um, we didn't take personal cars. We took a bus, and someone brought a drum. They're playing with their hands inside the bus. Uh, I, I just basically, I had to say, sorry, I'm either throwing the drum out the window or you got to stop because it was, it was out of this world. So it definitely had a psychological effect. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's what is it? I can't hear you. There's some uh, noise. Okay, yeah. 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 A lot of places have regulations. For example, um, if you ever fly into Switzerland, you'll never do it before 8 a.m. Because the airport there just says no landings before 8 a.m. Because they, they value quiet as an environmental resource. You know, noise is a pollution. And so um, places that are less interested in um, preserving like the public quality of life or maybe haven't gotten to the point where they're thinking through all the different kinds of pollution um, don't have the same kind of noise laws. I live in a rural area that's normally very quiet back in the United States. There's very few houses around. Normally it's very quiet, but uh, people like to practice gun shooting a lot. And so sometimes you're just sitting there on, on the weekend and then you hear gunfire like you're in a war zone almost. And it becomes a normal thing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm hmm Yeah. It's bad. I guess you get used to it. Some people, it doesn't bother them. There are some things you can do to soundproof. Next time when we get together in class, we're going to talk about how isolating those vibrations can make a place quieter. And so you can, if you have a point source that's very noisy, you can box that in in a certain way so that it doesn't radiate the sound outward. Or if you want to make a certain room quiet, then you can put up things that muffle the vibrations. But um, I would probably go crazy if I lived in the flight path of the Dubai airport because there's planes coming in and leaving at all hours of the day, and big planes too. The wider the plane, the noisier the, uh, the effect is of it because it, it's partly the cross-sectional area of the plane that has an effect on the sound. So just to put it into perspective, it's not just all kids dropping marbles at 4 a.m. to annoy you a little bit. It actually causes hearing loss, excessive noise levels. And just to give you an idea of perspective, in the United States alone, the U.S. has a labor pool of about 140 million workers. So out of 140 million people who are working, it's estimated that 1.7 million of them have experienced hearing loss. And that's in a place that supposedly has really high standards of safety, but for whatever reason, people not taking the standards seriously or the rules not being enforced, uh, the hearing damage that they've experienced, um, the financial value of it estimated to be about a billion dollars. And that's um, the money they're, they're having to spend on treatment, hearing aids, the lost productivity, and so on. To put it in another kind of perspective, uh, up until 2005, when the last estimates were available, um, in the United States, they had spent $2.8 billion building sound barriers. And that's something that you can do putting up a wall next to a freeway to try and keep the sound in the freeway zone and not radiating outward towards homes. And so there's about 2,900 kilometers of 2,900 linear kilometers. It may be on both sides of the road. Um, and so it's a very costly kind of pollution. 
Where we talk about air pollution, water pollution, and so noise is something that can either be prevented or mitigated. And usually prevention is a lot cheaper than mitigation. It's a lot cheaper to, to look at cars and find ways to streamline the vehicles and make the wheels and the tires so that they don't uh, cause as much noise. Like a hybrid car that has very good aerodynamics is going to generate less noise than a big truck that has the big fat knobby tires on it. You can hear those tires from a long ways away because they have so much vibration. Light pollution, yeah, that's another kind of, of unwanted uh, yeah, emission into the environment, absolutely. Especially if you're looking at the stars, right? All right, so what causes it? I'd already mentioned that it's vibration. This figure that's found in the book talks a little bit about how is it that vibration transmits to our ears. You know, if I start tapping here, how is it that the work I'm doing of tapping uh, causes a sound that you can hear? What it works out to is compression and rarefication of air. Uh, rarefy is the opposite of compress. And so as I tap two objects together, it's, it's not that you're, this isn't going into your ear. You know, the cell phone case isn't in your ear. It's the gases that are in this room are being compressed and rarefied in the vicinity of where the collision occurs. And then that um, the pressure wave radiates outward and by the time it gets to your ear, the gases that are in this room are still being compressed and rarefied enough that uh, your inner ear senses that. And so this figure on the left is showing, think of a piston. If a piston is moving back and forth, this is the mean position when it's in the middle. But sometimes it's to the right, sometimes it's to the left, it's going back and forth, and so it's compressing the air in the vicinity of that. And that wave propagates outward at the speed of sound, C. That's the variable that we're using for the speed of sound. So with localized increases and decreases in air density and pressure, and that wave that's traveling through the air that you hear. Um, so who's excited to see Star Wars? I'm excited to see Star Wars, right? I was watching Star Wars over the weekend. And uh, you can hear, like, they go through space and there's like a rumbling if it's a big ship, you know. If it's a small ship, it makes a different sound. But really, it wouldn't make any sound at all in space, right? Why is there no sound in space? There's no air. There are no gases to transmit the, uh, the vibrations to your ear. And so you wouldn't hear anything in space. Maybe if you're inside of a spaceship, you can hear some rumbling or something. But um, if we evacuated all the air from this room, we wouldn't hear anything. Partly because we wouldn't be breathing, but also because there wouldn't be any sound, right? All right. This figure down here in the lower right is showing an alternation, a sinusoidal alternation of uh, the pressure. And so sometimes the pressure is positive, sometimes the pressure is negative, but the wave is transmitted through the air. And the height of this peak has to do with the intensity that we perceive. The harder I pound my cell phone on this speaker, I really like this cell phone, as you can tell. The harder I pound it, the louder the noise will be, and the higher the amplitude of that uh, wave. What about how close together these waves are? Do you know what that has to do with? The frequency. And I have an app on my phone. I think I still have it. Let's see. It claimed to help with tinnitus. Let's see, where is that? It's a frequency generator. Here it is. All right, this is really a great app. How closely spaced the waves are has to do with the frequency that we hear. A high-pitched sound means that the waves are coming very quickly. Hmm, the app doesn't seem to be working. Wait. Maybe. Um, waves that are not very close together are low frequency sounds, like the bass. You know, like um, sometimes cars like to drive around with the sound up really loud and you just hear boom, 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 right? You can tell that those people really want of attention. Uh, like what you're hearing maybe is about 40 hertz or 30 hertz. 
Like that's how frequently the uh, waves are coming to your ear. Uh, this, I don't think this app's working anymore. Oh, here we go. It's hard to listen to, right? Okay. So, like, right, this is maybe, what you're hearing is that the waves are coming 3,000 times a second. And the higher pitched it is, oh, that's too much. All right. So, when it's a low frequency, it means the waves are coming less often. And so you perceive it as a, uh, as a deeper sound. When it's a high frequency, the waves are coming very quickly. So the period is the number of seconds between the peaks, if we're measuring P here on the figure, it's the amount of time between each peak. And it's going to be less than seconds, fractions of seconds. Frequency is what I was just saying, where what we were hearing before I switched it off was about, uh, I think that was 3,000 hertz. And so in every second, we would have 3,000 of the sound waves reach our ear. Um, the wavelength is related to the uh, frequency. The wavelength is uh, how far apart the waves are, and then the amplitude is the height of the waves, and it measures the, uh, um, the intensity of the sound. So here are some of the formulas we're actually going to use for calculation today with the in-class exercise, actually the one on the bottom. But before we start doing the calculations, uh, many of you have probably heard of decibels before, right? Uh, it's a very unusual scale. It's a nonlinear scale. And the reason is, is that we measure sound in nonlinear uh, with a, a logarithmic scale because our ears are so good at hearing. Um, it's, it's mainly be, the, the scale that we measure noise is a reflection of the efficiency of our ears. We can hear things that are very, very quiet and we can still perceive things that are very loud and the range in between represents such a huge huge difference in the amount of energy that's being exerted that on a linear scale uh, it would be tough to to quantify the difference in in an easy way um, if we if we take it out of a logarithmic scale as you'll see from the calculations we're talking about billions and billions of units beyond this reference power so 10 to the minus 12 watts is sort of, uh, it's known as the reference power level, and it's the baseline, you can think of it as a threshold of hearing. Many people, that's the lowest that they can hear, and so anything above that is, uh, is where we start to measure the sound power from. Um, there's sound power level and sound pressure level. The difference between the two is that when we are talking about power level, W is the amount of energy that's exerted in making the sound and its units of watts, whereas sound pressure level is measuring the effect of that work on the gases that are surrounding the collision. So it's the vibration, and remember that the, uh, the pressure is going up and down in a varying way. RMS here means root means it means root mean square. And um, so let me go back to this. You can see that the alternations are going back and forth, positive and negative. What would be the average pressure of, of that? If we just took the average of something that's going positive and then it goes negative. The average is going to be zero. And so we can't say we just want to take the if we're going to measure the, the intensity of sound, we don't just take the average of the pressure. What we have to do is somehow uh, take the absolute value so that it is uh, taking the negative and the positive into account. But then there's also the fact that it's, um, it's not straight up and then straight down. It has this uh, sinusoidal shape. And so the root mean square, just as background information, the root mean square function allows you to take care of both of those things. Take care of the fact that the, uh, the pressure is going high and positive and negative, but then also that it has a curved shape. This is ultimately what you'll need to know for the homework assignment, and that is uh, how we can combine multiple sources together. If you're in an environment where there's uh, more than one noise that is coming towards your ear, it may be the sound of ventilation, sound of speaking, 
It could be the clicking of your watch. Um, all of it can be combined and turned into a single intensity that your ear is perceiving at one time. And since it's a nonlinear scale, we have to uh, sort of do some unusual calculations to combine it all together. So this formula is what I'd like you to use when we go through in class exercise 35, the noise sources. Um, in this exercise, we are uh, in a coffee shop for part one, where we've got a cashier, espresso machine, some other customers, and background music. Those four sources that we want to find the combined sound level, L sub W. So what you'll do basically is for all of the sources, we'll have four of them, the measurement in decibels divide by 10, take 10 to that power, combine them all together with the sum function, the logarithm of that, and then multiply it by 10. And that tells you the combined uh, sound in decibels. So go ahead and do part one and then we'll take a look at the solution. Okay, I don't have the... Uh, I don't have the PDF to put up on the screen, but let me put it onto the board here. So we're trying to find the combined noise of those, two, of those four sources. So it'll be 10 times log of 10 to the 64 divided by 10, because the first source is 64 decibels, plus 10 to the 82 divided by 10, 10 to the 59 divided by 10, and 10 to the 61 divided by 10. Okay, so we had a source that was 64 decibels with the cashier, 82 decibels with the espresso machine, 59 from the other customers, and 61 from the background music. So we do this, and we basically will get that the, uh, the noise is 10 times 8 0.21, so that's 82.1 decibels. So it's interesting to note, is that right, 82.1? Since, um, since the espresso machine is so much louder than the other ones, they contribute almost no additional perceptible noise. When you have one thing that's so much louder, if you're standing next to a jet, you're not going to hear your friend talking as that much louder than the jet itself. But if, if two sounds are relatively close in volume, then the combined effect is much more noticeable. But since these are uh, pretty, li wi pretty widely varied, then you almost don't notice any additional noise from the three sources besides the espresso machine. All right, so let's take a uh, look at part two. Part two is a similar approach where we're going to use the same equation, but what we know is that every one of the sound sources is 106 decibels. We have a motorcycle that's that, that loud, and uh, if we have a group of people all have the same motorcycle and the combined effect is 115, we're trying to find out how many motorcycles are there. Okay, let's take a minute to uh, work on that one. All right, let me put the solution on the board here. Okay, we know the combined sound is going to be 115.54 decibels. And the form of our equation is that it should be 10 times log. And then inside the log, we put the sum of each, of each source together. So we're saying it's 10 to the... Uh, 106 divided by 10 plus however many, you know, multiple of them, where it's 10 to the 106 divided by 10. So what we can do, instead of just doing it two times and seeing if it equals, doing it three times and see if it equals, instead of that approach, um, we'll just do n times however many there are. So this times n and then solving for n. So it should be nine, nine motorcycles. And the way you can double check that is just have nine times 10 to the 106 divided by 10. So 10 to the power of 10.6. How many times do you have to, how many of those do you need for the overall volume to be 115.5 decibels? So 
would take nine motorcycles. So you get a sense for the nonlinearity of this. You don't just multiply 106 by 9 and that gives you the number of decibels. It's a, a logarithmic scale and because of that we have to do sort of these unusual calculations. All right. Let's take a uh, last look at these announcements before we finish for today. All right. It's going to be an exciting week. You've got a uh, quiz on Tuesday, right? And then the uh, homework, the noise homework is due on Thursday. Now that you've seen these calculations, I'd encourage you to do problem 10-4 and 10-5. Like, do it right now. You could probably solve it between now and when your next class starts, even if your next class starts at 1 o'clock. They're, they're quick problems, okay? You get half the homework assignment done in 10 minutes. Um, and looking into the future, last time um, some appointments were hard to get towards the uh, end of the due date, right? So even if you don't have your appointment today with the writing center, at least you can schedule it. So get online and schedule your writing center appointment because everyone in this class won't be able to go on December 13th and have their appointment at the same time. We have to spread them out a little bit. So I'd encourage you to uh, get online and make your appointment early. So you can just get that out of the way. All right. Have a great day. I'll see you on Tuesday for the quiz.